Hello everybody and thanks for joining us today for this presentation on wind and wave forecasting for Lake Champlain. My name is John Goff. I'm a lead forecaster here at the National Weather Service in Burlington, Vermont, and I'll be your host for the next 20 minutes to half an hour covering this presentation. The discussion topics for today's presentation include topographical influences on wind direction in the Champlain Valley, considerations when predicting wind speed, wave height predictions and challenges on Lake Champlain, and finally a discussion of data access, data and forecast access. So when we look at the Champlain Valley and its topography, it's generally a north to south oriented valley de depicted by the yellow arrow here in the map. It ranges anywhere between about 40 to 60 miles wide and is about 100 miles long with the city of Burlington, Vermont generally in the middle of the valley along the shores of Lake Champlain to the east. So given the north-south channel, north-south orientation of the valley, we often get a phenomenon called topographic wind channeling in the valley or channeled flow. As depicted by the image on the right, the winds tend to blow north and south in the valley due to the topography. They're channeled between the Green Mountains on the east and the Adirondack Mountains on the west. There's certainly smaller upslope and downslope flows off the mountains on any given day, and there can be wind directions that are different from the true north and south directions depicted by the map here. But in general, winds tend to blow north and south in the valley, and under certain conditions they become, can become channeled and stronger in the valley than surrounding areas as they become squeezed between the mountain ranges blowing uh, as the winds blow north and south. So that's what we describe as channeled flow. It's a very common feature in many narrow long valleys. In terms of climatology, one of the maps I always like to show is uh, something called a wind rose. It's basically a map depicting the general wind directions and speeds at a given site and location through time. The map I've shown here is a wind rose of Colchester Reef and this is a yearly wind rose that shows the cardinal wind directions, the main directions, and the speeds they blow at. So if you look at the map, the rose shows basically a strong bimodal north to south distribution. As you can see again, like we talked about earlier, the winds generally blow from north to south or south to north. And the predominant seasonal flow is from the south, depicted by the larger barbs and arrows extending to the south or to the bottom of the Colchester uh, Reef wind site in the middle of the chart. The winds also tend to blow, at least from a Colchester Reef standpoint, stronger from the south than any other direction most of the time. So I like to use this map to show the bimodality and the channeled flow in the valley. It's very typical in many sites of the valley. Colchester Reef is a little bit more extreme due to its location on the open lake, but you get the broad picture of what I'm trying to discuss here. So let's talk a little, about, a little bit about predicting wind speed. We have several observational platforms on the lake, our meteorological station data, Missisquoi Bay, Burton Island, Colchester Reef, and Diamond Island. Each of these sites have their pluses and minuses and some have their biases. For example, the Missisquoi Bay site is only a temporary site in the middle of the Missisquoi Bay. It's mainly there to diagnose hydrodynamic studies and pollution that runs off into Missisquoi Bay, but it does have wind sensors in the Missisquoi Bay site has a wave sensor, but it will be pulled out in a few years and will not be available anymore. The other three sites are, are along the main body of the lake. Burton Island has had some data outages in the recent past. It's on the south tip of Burton Island, so wind flow from the north is very blocked, so you don't get a really good representation of winds blowing from the north at Burton Island. But on south to southwesterly flow through St. Albans Bay, it can be a good uh, uh, source of data. You also have the Colchester Reef platform, which is perhaps the most reliable and has the longest period of record going back quite a, quite a ways, and is uh, on, basically anchored on the Colchester Reef uh, site where the old lighthouse used to be out there on the lake, is a, the most open water site and tends to be unblocked for most wind directions and is the most reliable. We also have Diamond Island in the far south, down toward the narrow part of the lake. It's a very good source of data when we're trying to depict winds from the north. It tends to to channel the flow down there and blow a little bit stronger so it can also be a good source of data. These, these sites other than Missisquoi Bay and the waves generally measure winds, temperature, dew point, water temperature, and relative humidity. 
And here are just a few pictures of the sites. You can see the Colchester Reef platform there. Diamond Island on the upper right and Missisquoi Bay, a more recent picture with the small uh, anchored buoy there in the middle of the bay. Alright, in terms of talking about wind speed and in particular marine wind speed, the one thing to consider when you're doing a, a forecast for marine wind speed is it's all about atmospheric mixing potential. There's a couple main rules you have to consider when you're talking about forecasting wind speeds over water. First of all, first off, there's less friction over water and the winds tend to be greater and what I mean by that is there's no trees and buildings and mountains along Lake Champlain to impede the wind flow. So it's a less obstructed wind flow and the winds tend to blow stronger because there's nothing to block the wind. It's pretty common sense. The next point is very important. The change of temperature in water is less than the change in temperature in air over a period of time, which I give this as triangle T or delta T. And if you think about that, it makes pretty much good sense. The air temperature on any, any given day will go up and down based off the sun rising and setting. Example, in the middle of summer, we may have a high of 80 and a low of 55 degrees. However, the water temperature on the lake does not change nearly to that magnitude. So the change in the water temperature over time is not as great. It may only change one degree or even less than one degree over that same period of time. Number three, the water air temperature profile governs the mixing. And as we move down, it's all about atmospheric instability and mixing. If you have cold air or cool air atop warm air, the atmosphere is more unstable and the atmosphere has become more mixed. And so stronger winds that are blowing aloft, maybe 500 feet to 1,000 feet above the surface, can be mixed down to the surface. It's an unstable environment. And I don't list it here, but I will show it in a later slide. The exact opposite is also true. So you have warm air atop cold air. It is actually more stable, and you have less mixing. Generally, the height of the marine layer over Lake Champlain is anywhere between about 1,000 and 1,500 feet above the surface. So as a forecaster, when I look at winds, and I'm forecasting for Lake Champlain, when I want to mix those winds down and I'm trying to get an idea of how strong I think the winds will be on the surface of the lake, I really don't look any higher than about 1,500 feet, and oftentimes I'll only look up to about 1,000 feet. The winds above that are really not going to play a factor into how much is going to mix the, uh, the surface, so I'm not looking at winds at 3,000, 5,000 feet. We've already talked about channeled flow and a low-level jet, which is a, basically just an enhanced channel flow. That can also be a very important phenomenon in the valley, and it, you have to take that into account uh, when you're forecasting for Lake Champlain because these low-level jets in the channel flow are very low-level, down 1,500 feet, 1,000 feet off the surface, and so can, can play a big factor in governing wind speeds on the lake. So here's a little chart that I always like to use when I talk about marine layer stability or atmospheric stability unstable and stable conditions, okay? So if you're a marine person that likes to recreate out on the lake, whether you're a, a fisherman or a, a kayaker or, or a, a, a ice fisherman, something like that, or just a, a recreational boater, if you're in the fall, you're basically in an unstable condition. So remember, unstable, you mix more. Things are more buoyant, the air's more buoyant, and you'll be able to mix. Your water temperature in the fall, let's say uh, September, early October, may still be around 60 degrees but you're already cooling off the air now to 45 degrees. So since the air temperature, cold air atop warmer air right by the lake surface, then you're gonna have an unstable situation and you'll tend to mix more. The opposite occurs in the spring, especially late winter and then especially into the spring and very early part of the summer. So this is a case where the water is still cold from the past winter. Let's say it's 45 degrees, the ice is all gone. The water is cold, but now you're warming up in the spring. The sun angle is higher. So you have an air temperature of 60. The water temperature is 45. So you're now having a situation where you have warmer air atop colder air right by the water surface, and you're going to have less, less mixing, less potential to bring stronger winds down aloft. And as we move to the next slide here, this is exactly what this chart depicts. Basically what you're looking at here is the average monthly temperature at Colchester Reef depicted by the blue line and Burlington, Vermont, BTV, which is our code here at the airport, depicted by the red line. And you can see the seasonal rise and fall of the seasons, uh, rise and fall of the temperatures through the seasons. But as you notice is you're in the fall period out September, October, November, December, and then into the early part and mid part of winter, you notice that the water temperature on the lake is warmer 
than the water t than the average temperature over land, which is in Burlington. Now you're assuming the, the lake is not frozen. Let's assume an open water condition here. In that case, the air over the lake is going to be actually warmer than what the lake temperature is. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, colder than what the lake temperature is. So in that case, depicted by the shaded blue areas, you're going to have more mixing out there and the winds are going to tend to blow stronger. Conversely, in the late spring or spring into the summertime, Burlington's heating up over land. You're having highs in the 60s and 70s and even 80s. And those air temperatures, those average air temperatures, they're now becoming water warmer than the lake temperature. So you're going to have generally less mixing during the spring and into the summer months. Now there's a variety of factors that go into why the winds blow stronger or lighter. Generally in winter you have stronger storm systems and bigger wind systems anyway. But in the broad sense, the wind tends to sh this chart tends to show why the winds blow stronger in the fall and winter than they do in the spring and summer. And for those of you who recreate on the lake in the fall, you ab absolutely know that your stronger wind season on the lake when you're still out there recreating is more like late August into September and October as opposed to May and June. This is another chart that just shows Colchester reef climatology. It's a little bit on the old side, but I still like to use it because it kind of gives the same picture that the previous chart showed. This is the Colchester reef wind frequency of greater than or equal to 25 knots, which is a common aviation and marine uh, unit of measure of wind speed. 25 knots is about 29 miles an hour. And it basically shows all the years from 1996 to 2007 and the frequency. This is, a, this is an 18 month chart, so kind of taking you through the whole 18 month season so you're not kind of cutting the chart off at the beginning and the end. And the main black line there, the thick black line, is the median, or basically the average more or less. Median is a little bit different than the average, but the median of all the years combined. And so if you focus mainly on the black line, it kind of shows the same thing. The frequency of the number of events, which is depicted on the, the y-axis, is much higher in October, November, December, January than it is in May, June, and July. Kind of shows the same thing that that earlier chart I showed um, um, said, but just another way to look at the data. But again, it emphasizes the fact that the more unstable conditions are in the fall and winter as opposed to the spring and early summer. Again, that's the highlighted area that I was just talking about when your stronger winds would more likely occur on average. Okay, let's take a look at some general rules of thumb if the forecast in the atmosphere is unstable. You take the maximum wind in the lowest 1,500 feet. Another good rule of thumb is your maximum wind gust expected at Burlington is a generally good rule of thumb for sustained winds on the lake. These are empirical type of, uh, of uh, rules based by observation. And if we go to the general rules of thumb, if the atmosphere is stable, the maximum winds on the lake generally will be less than Burlington, and you only take the maximum winds in the lowest 500 feet. So when I'm doing a forecast in a stable condition in May, I'll only look at the t lowest 500 feet. You're generally not going to mix more below that because the water is still very cold in May. This next chart here is an atmospheric sounding. Um, it's one of the tools we use to diagnose weather on a variety of different things, anywhere between forecasting snow, forecasting rain, how strong winds are over land, but we can also use it over the water. And what I'm showing here, if you focus mainly on the left side of the vertical green and red lines, it's basically showing a, a sample of the temperature and dew point profile in the atmosphere in the lowest 3,000 feet, depicted by one two and at the very top of the top of the chart three there so the one horizontal line shows 1,000 feet above the surface the two horizontal line shows 2,000 feet above the surface okay so if we're looking in a stable condition highlighted by the yellow box here I'm only, only going to look at 500 feet off the surface and the model in this case at Burlington is showing that the wind should be 180 at 25 knots 180 is the cardinal direction for south winds we use the compass directions to dictate well, where the wind direction comes from and it's estimating that at 6 p.m. on Sunday March 31st 2013 that the winds would be south at 25 knots and if we actually look at the verifying observation at that time we were a little more south southwest at about 23 knots you noticed 
that it's a warm air over cold air situation. That 50 over 30 is the air temperature and dew point at Colchester Reef, so a 50 degree air temperature. And notice the water temperature is 35 degrees. So you're going to be stable and you're not going to mix as much. So that verified pretty well. It was a little more southwesterly than what the model indicated, but in terms of the speeds you're pretty much, you're pretty much very close. Okay, let's move on to some wave height forecasting and talk about some of the ways we go about doing that on Lake Champlain. So the first thing that's very pretty directly obvious on Lake Champlain is we have very limited direct wave measurements on the open lake. It's not like the Great Lakes or the open ocean or along the coast where they have a lot of deployed buoys with wave height sensors. We heavily rely on model-based wave height solutions in lieu and the lack of uh, observational data. We also have old empirical wave height relationships available and again when I, what I mean by empirical is basically just through observation through the years what have the ferry captains told us on what a 15 knot or a 20 or 30 knot wind will do out on the lake. So personal observations relating wind speed to wave height. But again we more rely on the model based solutions which are much more fine scale detail and can go out through time. The wave model we've been using here in the National Weather Service in Burlington over the last number of years is the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory wind wave model. It's one of the main wind wave models they use to forecast on the Great Lakes, Lake Superior, Lake Erie, Ontario, etc. And kind of a couple of important points about this model, the winds drive the waves and it's an inland model, meaning a non-ocean model. So we don't take fetch into account as in the open water Wave Watch 3 and WNA wave models that they use on the open ocean. What I mean by fetch is how long the wind runs along the water. As opposed to an inland body of water like Lake Champlain or a, 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 you know, a large body of, of water on a lake, on a smaller lake such as Lake Champlain, you really, don't, you really don't have a long run of wind over the water as opposed to something like Lake Superior or more so like the open ocean where the winds can blow hundreds of miles across the water and build up the wave heights over a long period of time. We just don't get that on Lake Champlain. The perfect solution would be a north-south wind um, on the lake and that would get at most a fetch of about 30 to 40 miles. So it's not a, a fetch is not a huge thing that's taken into account. So we don't take that into account. We do take ice uh, into account. So when the lake starts to freeze up and we get satellite data to show what parts are frozen, uh, we do begin to take ice into account and we'll remove the wave heights in our forecast based off of where the ice is observed. This is just a chart on the right that shows one of our Lake Champlain models and it shows some um, basically wave heights and note the northern part of the lake is all zeroed out by the dark purple and the wave heights are 0, 0.0. That's where we've determined that ice is covering the lake and further south on the open part of the lake the water, uh, the ice is not there, it's still open water so we'll have uh, wave forecasts for that part of the lake. And that's just an arrow and a circle showing the ice covered part of the lake there. Empirical relationships, I touched briefly on that. Local studies, we also have deep water navy nomogram empirical studies. Occasionally we'll use those. So here, this is a study done by a local forecaster here. Um, back in the summer of 2004 and based off of some of his observations these were some of the wave heights that he saw. This is an example of a deep water nomogram where you can cross correlate the wind speed to the fetch length but again I spoke that we don't have a lot of fetch length here um, on Lake Champlain so it's not a not a huge deal uh, generally speaking on Lake Champlain. Okay when we're talking about wave height, one of the most particular things that you need to keep in mind is something called significant wave height. It, it's what we report as wave height, and it's something important to talk about in the context of this presentation, so I'm going to spend just a few moments on this. So significant wave height is basically the average of the highest one-third of the waves on the open water. This is exactly the same definition as they use on the deep water oceanic wave forecast from the Ocean Prediction Center, the big offshore forecast for the Atlantic and Pacific, and the coastal forecast. The highest wave on any given forecast period, in our case 12 hours, today, tonight, tomorrow, etc., is theoretically twice the height of the significant wave. 
and significant wave height is usually expressed in ranges, one to three feet, etc. This is a chart that shows the statistical wave distribution um, and significant wave height. So as you go through time, um, there's a, the, the y-axis up and down shows increasing number of waves. So the higher the chart goes, there's more waves there. And as you go from left to right, you get higher waves. Okay. So the significant wave height is the highest third of the waves. Okay. So <clears throat> the average of the highest third of the waves. Okay. So the highest third of the waves is depicted by that delineation between that green color and blue color. And the average, so everything to the right of that is the highest third of the waves. And the significant wave height is the average of the highest third of the waves. So it's that second arrow there to the right labeled significant wave height. But as you can see, there are other waves less frequent as you go out through time that are even higher than that. Okay, So if I give a significant wave height of one to three feet on the lake, that's going to be the average highest third of the waves. There are going to be waves that are less than one feet and there's going to be one foot and there'll be a few waves over a 12 hour period that may be four or five feet. But that's not going to be most of the waves. Most of the waves are going to be less than the significant wave height. We always report in significant wave height because that gives the user the best information about what is the worst case scenario and what is the roughest, roughest types of conditions they can expect out there on the lake. So something very important to, con to consider. This is another uh, significant wave height and this is an observational, um, some observational data from a buoy out, of, out in the central Gulf of Mexico during Hurricane Ivan a few years back. Now, of course, these wave heights you're never going to see on Lake Champlain, fortunately, but you do get these big wave heights in a hurricane. You can get a lot of fetch, big wave heights. So it's very important. So if you look basically on the x-axis on the bottom, there's your wave heights ranging from 0 to 100 feet, okay? And the significant wave height, at least basically based off of this buoy, was about 52 or 53 feet. The most frequent wave height though was more like 26 feet and the average wave height was about 33 feet. The average height of the highest 10% of the waves were about 67 feet and there were some a few reported waves at this buoy which I don't have plotted that were close to 90 feet. Okay, So that's kind of the concept we use when we forecast stuff. So if I'm doing a, if I was doing a significant wave height for this buoy in this location and I was an open water forecaster and I'm wanting to give the mariner the best possible forecast that I could generally give, okay, I would say waves generally probably in the passage of this hurricane, I'd give, I'd give broader ranges, probably 40 to 60 feet or 50 to 60 feet. Um, but hopefully the marine forecaster who's, who's seasoned out there would realize you don't want to be in a hurricane and waves could be higher than that. Okay. Moving on, let's talk a moment a little bit about SAISH um, and what that means. SAISH is a standing wave in an enclosed body of water. It's also called slosh. It's a phenomenon forced by the wind. Basically, water piles up on the windward end of the lake and it drops on the leeward side. Kind of picture it almost like a bathtub with water sloshing back and forth in the back bathtub. The water goes up and down at each end based off of in our case in the natural environment where the wind direction is blowing from. Long narrow lakes are particularly susceptible. Lake Erie is a prime example, Lake Champlain is another. Amplitudes and wave heights are, have been known to, to occur up to 16 feet on Lake Erie. On Lake Champlain it's a little bit of a smaller scale phenomenon, somewhere about a foot to 18 inches on a strong wind of 30 to 40 knots blowing for a 12 hour period. This is a chart or a, a picture that just shows, an illustration that shows what the SAGE means. So if south is to the left and north is to the right on this picture, if you're having a strong south wind blowing from left to right, the water will pile up on the northern end of Lake Champlain and it will drop on the southern end of Lake Champlain. So the water sensors we have at Rouse's Point will show a higher lake level than the water sensors down in this very southern part of the lake. And this whole phenomenon can slosh back and forth when the wind lets up, it'll slosh back to the south. So it's a, it's this is a idealized example, and it shows it much higher than it, in reality it really is. Again, on Lake Champlain, it's only about 18 inches, but that can play a significant role 
when you're near flood level on the lake, which is 100 feet. We ran into this back in 2011, the real high water year, when we set all of those lake water level records of near 103 feet. If you have a strong south wind on that and you add three, four foot waves on top of that near flood level, water level, then that can be particularly important, especially on the windward end of the lake where the water's piled up due to the seiche. So it is something to consider. Um, and uh, there are modeling efforts underway to, to work on some of these phenomena. This is an example of a Lake Erie water displacement event back in November of 2003 from the National Weather Service out in Buffalo and the Great Lakes Coastal Forecasting System from NOAA out in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And it shows a big um, southwest wind event. If you're familiar with Lake Erie, it's kind of situated and oriented kind of south west southwest to east northeast. And so if you look at the water level at Toledo on the west end of the lake, it dropped to almost minus eight feet with zero being the mean water level. And at Buffalo on the far east end of the lake, it was up to about five feet. So that's eight to five, that's about a 13 foot seiche magnitude during that time at about 12 UTC time on the 13th, or on the 14th, I should say. So just a nice plot showing what a seiche would look like. Lake Erie is a very shallow lake. Most of the lake's 30 to 60 feet deep. Um, that's also something you have to consider in seiche. It can, uh, can greatly influence the magnitude of a seiche. So when we forecast a seiche, the water level forecast that we use were performed by the National Weather Service River Forecast Centers. In our case, it's the Northeast River Forecast Center, NERFC, down outside of Boston, Massachusetts. We actually coordinate them for all of our river and lake forecast, and they're modeling a lot of this stuff. And we, we heavily rely on their forecast and output when we're coordinating river flood warnings and lake flood warnings. Large seiche events in our lake, of course, occur during strong uh, south and north wind events. And that's when you get the biggest seiche. And again, when lake is near flood, the wave impacts on top of the seiche could be significant on, on shoreline communities or shoreline property. Okay, let's move on and take a quick look at the Lake Champlain forecast as we near the end of the presentation here. We issue a full package twice daily. Um, generally speaking, on the morning package issued early morning, we do a today, tonight, tomorrow forecast. And on the afternoon package, we do include the second day out. So we'll do a tonight, tomorrow, tomorrow night, and the day after that. We always update the conditions um, as they warrant. So if conditions change from what our forecast is, we'll update that. And the forecast includes uh, forecast for winds, wave height, significant weather, and any visibility restrictions. We do issue advisories for wind, which in our case is 25 knots. And any thunderstorms with lightning in the vicinities, we will put out thunderstorm advisories for mariner hazards. There's several formats that you can access the Lake Champlain forecast with. The recreational forecast can come in just a general text forecast, a rip and read type thing over the radio or something that's just easy to read. Keep in point, these forecasts are average conditions over the entire lake. So the model takes all the winds over all the small points on the lake and averages it all together and spits out a forecast for each period. So local conditions will often vary from what this text forecast will say. And we get, get comments every year asking them why it's different from what they're observing. There could be a reason that the forecast isn't that good. <laughs> or it also could be a reason that these forecasts here, this rip and read text forecast, is too generic and watered down for their specific location. So therefore, we give other options to the marine user or recreational user. We have graphical forecasts. So this is a color shaded graphical output. And basically, it's off our recreational page, which I'll give you the URL in a minute. And you can choose the element there under the little drop down choose element box. And you can choose what the wind is, waves, and weather over a period of time in the forecast. And you can error through the time steps. And it'll show you where your particular location is and what could be expected. It's on a Google map overlay, so you can zoom in. And it allows visualization that a text forecast can't provide. We also have point forecasts, which is also a text forecast, but it's a point forecast based off that graphical forecast that I just showed you. So it's the finest detail you can get. These are two and a half kilometer grid boxes. It's custom worded. It's a custom worded forecast just for the individual grid box. In this case, it's showing Shelburne Bay. So it can add value over the averaged full lake text forecast, 
But again, these even at two and a half kilometers, it may not capture very local effects. For example, in Shelburne Bay, many of you, many of you that do kayaking or boating on Shelburne Bay know that on a strong north wind or northwest wind, the waves will pile up in there. The model in general does a pretty good, has a pretty good handle on that, but very local effects in the bay itself could be different. So again, you always use your local experience and personal observation. But again, these point forecasts, these detailed point forecasts are the finest scale detail. In terms of Lake Champlain forecast information, you can visit it on the web at weather.gov slash btv slash recreation. And then off that page, there are lake graphical and lake point forecasts. Now I should say, and I got a question on this when we did the presentation um, online webinar a few months back, there is also, and I don't have it listed here, there's also data access just to the raw model data that also shows wind and wave forecasts for the lake. So I did want to bring that point up here. There's the graphical and lake point and text forecast for the lake, which is our forecast. There is also a link on our recreational page that lets you look at the raw model data, just what the model says. It's not QC'd. Um, it's kind of some of the background information that we look at, but it does have some inherent biases. One thing to point out in particular is the lake model will tend to put waves uh, too high for stronger wind speeds. So with 30 knots on a south wind, I'll go three to five feet for significant wave height. Sometimes you'll see the model put out eight foot waves out on Lake Champlain, and I know that's unrealistic. But again, that data is also there for you, um, and it's pretty self-evident on the web page to click on the model versus what the full forecast is. But I did want to make that point. We also have a link on the recreational page, uh, an FAQ link that I put together um, that answers frequently asked questions about the forecast process, a lot of which I talked to you about today here and differences between the text graphical and point-based forecasts. It addresses local wind and wave phenomenon also in the bays and inlets. And that's the URL there if you'd like to bookmark that or take a look at that, but that's also available uh, on a link off the recreational page. So in summary, wind forecasting for water and marine locations is heavily influenced by atmospheric stability, remember unstable or stable, and the ability to mix the air aloft to the surface extremely important. Wave forecasting generally relies on model-based solution from the glural wind wave model output and we express the waves as significant wave height. Remember the average of the top third of the waves. Forecasts are created twice daily and updated as needed and they come in text, graphical, and point-based forecasts. And finally here are some references uh, that you can address questions to. Uh, the erbtvsocialnetwork.gov uh, address. Um, you can also follow us on the web or engage with us on social media. We have a Facebook and Twitter um, link, so you can go on that. And again, the weather.gov BTV recreational page. Uh, you can view that as you need to to get all your latest forecasts for the lake. I want to thank you for your time, and hopefully you gained a little information about how we go about forecasting for the lake today. Thank you very much and have a good day.